this is a basic question, but what does a software architect actually do? That's a good question because it doesn't have a really good answer, which is one of the tricky things about talking about software architecture or producing IP around software architecture because it's a really big sprawling area of interest because it covers certainly technical things like developers need to know, but it also covers things like soft skills and negotiation techniques and, and you know awareness of business domain problems and being able to apply technical solutions to business domain problems. And so there's a, a kind of a pastiche of all of these different things together in a software architect role and adding to the confusion here there's no standard definition in companies as to what software architect is so in most companies it's just you're the senior most technical person and you end up with this role this title of architect and so some companies have different kinds of architects data architects and system architects and solution architects some just have you know B flat architects so it's it's a really tricky thing to define because the industry has no kind of standard definition even within the same company it's it's kind of up in the air would software architect be sort of the umbrella term for all of those other variations like data architect? Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's the general kind of umbrella term, which is why I put that on my business cards. That's part of my title, a software architect, because I really do a combination of application architecture, integration architecture, and enterprise architecture. And uh, all those things overlap, but they're all architecture one way or the other. I see. I've heard that the term architect at one time had a bad connotation in the software world. Is that still the case? It less so now because software is kind of becoming cool again because of companies like Netflix and Amazon. Uh, for a long time, architect really meant post-useful <laughs> business card. <laughs> it means you spend way more time in Visio than you do in any kind of code editor. The, the, and the, the negative uh, stereotype was the ivory tower architect who never really touches anything for real, just sits and thinks deep thoughts in an ivory tower somewhere. That's less so now, I think because we've gradually come to realize that the role of architect, you can't really operate as an abstraction. You have to think about things like, how do I operationalize this architecture? You know, how do, I, how do I actually put this live and then evolve it over time to upgrade pieces of it? So I think uh, architecture has become much more interesting now because it's become much more encompassing and trying to solve real problems rather than kind of play with abstractions. Uh, one of the problems in software, I think, is that you build everything on towers of abstractions and so it's very easy to get to a point where all you're doing is playing with abstractions and you don't you don't reify that back to the real world and I think that's the danger of this kind of ivory tower architect but when you start looking at things like continuous delivery and continuous deployment you have to take those operational concerns into account and I think that is making the role of architect a lot more relevant now because they are becoming much more involved in the, the entire software development ecosystem not just the front edge of it. So is it a real relatively new development that that connotation has evolved out of being a bad thing? Yeah, uh, you know, within the last maybe five or ten years, okay. uh, in the 90s really when case tools and model driven architecture was really popular and on the, the rise, uh, you know, it was almost considered uh, beneath architects to code, you know, because they have too many deep thoughts to think and, you know, too many important tools <laughs> that are expensive to use. And we've gotten completely the polar opposite of that now, right. where we realize that you have to keep a practitioner's knowledge of how things work before you can make effective decisions. Kind of related to that, what do you feel are the two or three most important things that a developer needs to acquire as he or she moves into a software architecture role? Uh, that's a good question, because as a developer, you're very concerned about micro things, you know, how how languages and frameworks and APIs work and how to stitch all those things together. And so you very often are very involved in application architecture. As you start stepping up to the architect's role, you have to start thinking still in application architecture, but a little more broadly about how this fits into the overall ecosystem and start thinking about integrating with other pieces. You also have to start thinking about some soft skill kinds of things like you know how do you make your case for a refactoring in a meeting or something like that or how do you convince a business person that this is the right technological direction to go versus this one uh, you have to manage your time a lot better as you become an architect because all of a sudden you're in meetings all day that you know you're t pulled away from kind of technical things so balancing your time is something that's a kind of a unique challenge for a lot of developers where their day is managed for them until they get to this role and all of a sudden they're much freer to manage their time and so there are a lot of tricky things to start to start navigating once you start ascending into that role. How about once you are a software architect, what are the things that you need to nurture as you're going along? Well, I think it's really important to understand um, kind of technical depth and breadth 
So you obviously want technical depth on some things, and you may think you want deeper and deeper technical depth, which are depths which are things you're expert on. But as an architect, you're actually better off slacking off a little on that and building up the pool of what my colleague Mark Richards calls the things that you know you don't know, um, because that really contributes to your breadth rather than your depth. So as an architect, you need to be able to apply a variety of different solutions and to be able to see a particular problem and realize, oh, that matches with this solution from a technology standpoint. So the more technologies you know about, even if you don't have deep knowledge in them, the more available, the more ability you have to apply those things intelligently and learn more about them selectively when you need to. And so I think that's one of the things people think that the architect is the absolute stone cold expert on every single API in the application, but that's, that's too much to keep in your head when you're trying to keep all those other things in your head. So breadth is actually more beneficial than, for an architect than very narrow but very uh, significant depth. What about delegation? And by that I mean for a new software architect, somebody who's coming from a coding background, do they need to resist the urge to dive into the code and instead to delegate that out to team members? Yeah, that's absolutely a really tough thing to do because you have the, you know this what the solution is, so your your impulse is just go in there and fix it, but it's actually better off if you can lead somebody else toward that solution. So uh, uh, one of the ways we can kind of avoid taking over completely with someone is pair with them and actually collaborate with them to build some solution. And that's a good way to convey a kind of information in a, in a very technical, in a very collaborative way, but it's not so, so much of a, you know, you go do this and I'll go do this other thing. I read a post recently that made the case for software architecture as a skill instead of a specific job. What's your take on that? Well, it is certainly a skill. I mean, it, you know, the job is really just a title. And, and like I said, it really is meaningless in, out within the industry, uh, even within companies, it's kind of meaningless. So it, it really is a role on projects. And there's nothing, I mean, if you have a little two-person project, then you are doing architecture on that project whether you want to or not. One of the things we talk about here at the Software Architecture Conference is this idea of an accidental architect where you're a developer working on a one or two person project and you're having to make architectural decisions whether you're called an architect or whether you realize that or not. So it is definitely a role because you, you kind of can slide in and out of it on small projects all the time. But then as projects get bigger, that becomes a bigger responsibility because you're having to consider more moving parts and how they interact with one another. What's the relationship between software architecture and DevOps? Used to, those were completely separate roles that almost never communicated with one another, lived in different silos within big enterprises, but we realize that's kind of a naive perspective now because things happen in operations that have an impact on architecture and design. If some service pack comes out for production operating system that is incompatible with the way you've written your code, that's a feedback loop that you need to be aware of as quickly as possible. And so, uh, Really, the DevOps revolution has taught us that architects need to be really upfront about their concerns about what is it going to take to make this architecture work in, in an operational space. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much interest now in this microservice style of architecture, which is really the kind of first post-DevOps revolution architecture. It's the first architecture that really fully embraces all the things that you need to operationalize that architecture as well. For a long time, kind of the defining characteristic of architecture and software was it's hard to change, to make changes to it, and so you had to make the right decisions up front front because the cost was so high to make changes, but if you look at a microservice style architecture, change is built into the architecture because you have taken care of all the operational concerns at that really encapsulated level, at the microservice level, you can change those things out with relative ease, so now suddenly architecture is not the thing that makes change difficult, and so it's a, an evolved way of thinking about architecture. I think that all architectures going forward are going to have to think about all those operational concerns and really take that feedback loop into account, uh, but microservices just happens to be the first one that Interesting. does that. Interesting, so do you see a, a closer merging between software architecture and DevOps? Yeah, absolutely, a lot more consideration of those concerns. I mean, one of the things that we're really adamant about now is that someone from DevOps and operations should be a full-time member of a software development team because things happen all the time they need to be be able to react to. Uh, if you do that, then you cut way down on churn and other sorts of useless engineering activities because you can learn things as quickly, as eagerly as possible as you can on projects. In the past, did software architects have to get, have that sense of, I better get this right from the beginning because change is, 
is, is a huge deal? Well, a lot of the, the, the effort in the 90s for these big case, these computer assisted software engineering tools was exactly that, to go sit somewhere for weeks and days and months and figure out how to get it all right so that you wouldn't have to make changes to it. Uh, and they thought that was the way to model the world, but we realized the world moves way too fast to do that. You can't create, create abstractions like that that survive the real world very long. You can't spend a year and a half designing a software system and then spend another year building it because it's going to be so out of date by the time it ships that it's useless. And so that's really why you have to take all these operational concerns into account if you want to move at the speed that business is now requiring IT to move. Do you anticipate that something like microservices is going to change the role of the software architect instead of um, going in a room and having to get everything right from the beginning, it's more of move quickly and figure out what works and what doesn't? Well, I think software architects are already doing that. I think what microservices is doing is making people realize what the software architect's job is. Because they're the ones who ultimately have to figure out how to get these services to collaborate with one another. Because the other side effect of microservices is it takes application architecture and kind of explodes it into integration architecture. And so now there are a lot of architectural concerns about how things work that you really have to take into account to make sure things work correctly. So it really highlights, the, it makes the, the software architecture job more interesting because it, they have to take a lot more into consideration now because there are more moving parts and the interactions between the moving parts are complex. And, there, and so there are a lot of engineering practices in that space, like consumer-driven contracts is a good example of an engineering practice that allows individual services to evolve at their own rate, but then not break the integration points that they've agreed on. So there's a lot of those kind of concerns that now move to the forefront uh, in the role of software development, and the architect's kind of the chief of that. So I think it's just adding more prominence to that role. This question has basically nothing to do with what we've been talking about, but I noticed that you have the phrase meme wrangler on your business card. What is that exactly? Yeah, well, ThoughtWorks, for better or for worse, lets people choose their own titles for their business cards. Uh, and there are a few reserved, like chief scientist and things like that. And so uh, my very first set of business cards, it was application architect, because that was my role at ThoughtWorks at the time. But this was about 10 years ago, and I realized that in a lot of companies that sort of implied post-useful. And so I changed it to the very much more abstract meme wrangler for my next set of business cards. Uh, meme is a Richard Dawkins term. It's the, a viral unit of thought. So a meme is to a thought as a gene is to DNA. And of course, wrangle has a nice d dual connotation as in herding or in uh, solve, sort of med mediating arguments. And I do both of those things. So kind of an idea wrangler and you know discussions around ideas. Um, and so it's, it's, it's weird that, you know, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because that more and more my role at ThoughtWorks has been kind of that role. <laughs> and my business cards now uh, reflect what I do, which is software architecture and meme wrangler at ThoughtWorks. So, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the interesting side effects of a company that doesn't, uh, not stuck on formality right. like titles. Right. <laughs> Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? I'm very interested in the closure space and a lot of the ideas around uh, functional architectures. I think are very interesting about building immutable architectures and there's a lot of stuff going on in the functional programming world and particularly Scala, or particularly Clojure. Uh, I like the Scala world as well but Clojure has some really beautiful design decisions and just the philosophy behind what's happening in that community is really nice so I'm, I'm following that community quite closely. There's a lot of interesting things happening in the architecture world right now. Certainly there's a huge amount of interest in microservices. There's a lot of interest in reactive styles of architecture, which is kind of a new uh, architecture style that's starting to penetrate in all these different places. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in architecture right now. I think it's the, the most fascinating part of the, uh, the software development world right now, so I'm happy to be involved in it. Great, well thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot.